Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Austin Lynn. Um, he is on a search for, I guess, identity is the right word to say. Um, and I actually think that's really an important thing because knowing who you are and where you come from is really important. But the most important part is knowing that you are a child of God. In fact, if we remember this past year, President Nelson said that the things we need to remember are we are children of God, we are disciples of Christ, and we are children of the covenant. And those are the most important things. But uh, knowing the other things about ourselves gives us strength and gives us purpose and gives us uh, a history. And so, anyway, Austin is on a journey to find those things. And also, he just is so grateful for the gospel. It, it makes his life bright and shiny and full. And I hope you hear that through his message today. So, here is Austin. I'm on the phone tonight with Austin Lynn. Um, he is... Um, a new friend and I'm really grateful for him I got his name from a mutual friend of ours and I'm really grateful for that and uh, Austin would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible if it's in your language great if it's not that's fine not everybody speaks their language and some languages are dead Theo my name's Austin uh, that's the uh, traditional Cherokee greeting for hello uh, I'm not fluent in Cherokee. It's not widely spoken today, but I've been trying to uh, learn a little bit as part of connecting with that tribal identity. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's super cool because Cherokee is one of the one of the nations that are actually trying to bring it back. But I mean, bring it back is still a long way to go. So I appreciate that. Um. Austin, would you share something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything, a story, a celebration, a way of life, a ceremony. What do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel? Yeah, so something I've uh, really appreciated about my heritage is there is such an emphasis on uh, family and storytelling in the community. And both of those things, um, I'm, I suppose every culture appreciates family in its own way. But uh, as I've just learned more about uh, the Cherokee culture, they have such a unique emphasis on uh, creating family and then also bringing people into families and keeping them there that I've just really loved. And it's just been one of those things that shows the light of Christ within everybody to me, that people find ways to form these really strong family connections and then maintain those as much as possible. And then the second piece about uh, storytelling. Uh, I love storytelling and I think it's uh, something that's kind of built into us physically and spiritually. When I look at the scriptures, I see God using stories uh, from the beginning to today to try to help us remember things and learn things, especially about our relationships. And so one thing I've loved has been learning about the rich mythology and uh, just traditional stories uh, available in Cherokee culture. Um, it's one of my favorite things is to see, uh, to learn new stories, uh, to hear ranging from, you know, simple tales that are almost like Aesop's fables of uh, people outsmarting animals or animal spirits outsmarting others, all the way down to stories about uh, how like, God's great spirits feel and even just uh, the exploits of heroic figures in Cherokee history. Yeah, I love that. Um, I like how you phrase you uh, phrase that about families too, about how it's important in every culture, but it's 
different though in every culture. The way we celebrate family is different. The way we, the way we honor it, and uh, I I think that's um, I was just thinking about the what has become an intertribal um, saying to look at seven generations back and seven generations forward. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I I love too the storytelling thing. I um once upon a time did some some uh, assemblies for some elementaries, and I told stories, and then I had the kids talk about all the things that they could learn from it. And so uh-huh. it's just like what you just said in our scriptures. We can learn more than just one one thing from a story. We can learn so many things from stories. Right. Yeah. So, Austin, I don't know very much about you. Were you raised as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? So, uh, mostly. (laughs) I wasn't born in the covenant uh, because my parents were actually uh, high schoolers when I was conceived. But they did stay together, and uh, my mother was a member of the church, and my father converted a few years later. So I remember being sealed in the temple when I was uh, four or five. Uh, But as far back as I can remember consciously, like my family's been active in the church. That's so cool. I love that. Um, So you were raised as a member of the church. Where where did you grow up? I grew up in Olathe, Kansas. It's kind of a suburb of Kansas City. It's a few hours north of the border of Oklahoma, which is where the Cherokee Nation is. So, you know, somewhere a few generations up, they slowly made their way north. (laughs) Got it. Uh, Both parents Cherokee or just one? Uh, Just on my father's side. So did you have much, um, did you have much learning from his family? Did you have much time with them as you were growing up? So my experience, is that I did see the family a lot, but my family on that side was almost completely disconnected from that heritage. And it wasn't, I would say it's probably been in the last 10 years or so that I've even become aware of it. And in large part, it's been to get access to um, government resources. And it was that that initially kicked off this discovery of identity and exploring that more. So there was some disconnect a few generations back where I just uh, completely, my dad's family just became completely disconnected from that tribal identity. And it's just now in the past several years that we've started to uh, reconnect to that. So is this like a whole family thing that you're reconnecting? Like your parent, your dad and your siblings? Yeah, so my da- my dad's father, he's uh, living in Oklahoma now, and so he um, occasionally will uh, stop by and uh, be a little involved, but not quite. I mean, he's at that stage in his life where he doesn't do very much now. Uh, my dad has done a little bit of research, uh, just finding out like who our ancestors on the dolls roll are and things like that. Um, and so far, I think I've been the one who's kind of let out the most in trying to do things like learning a little bit of the language and finding some of the educational resources out there. Uh, That's kind of been an interesting journey for me is that there's not exactly a website that says, uh, so you found out your um, member of whatever tribe, here's what you need to know. (laughs) It's, It's interesting trying to find these things like, oh, well, even just having to look up basic questions like is Cherokee still spoken? Uh, what's the tribal government like right now? Uh, what what can I do to learn about it? Because and because I lack that uh, being raised in the culture, so it's been a really interesting experience trying to find these resources for learning about it. Um, almost like an outsider, but as an outsider with a bit of claim to that identity. So what what do you do? How do you go about doing this? So one of the best resources for me has been that the Cherokee Nation has uh, been really good about uh, a YouTube presence, actually. I believe the channel is called Visit Cherokee Nation, and they put out videos about cultural events that are going on, um, like lots of different art galleries and things like that. Uh, they do 
uh, little language snippets each week. And one of my favorite things is they regularly get Cherokee storytellers on uh, to share stories. And then there's been a few different um, academics, academically oriented individuals who do deeper primers on the language. But it's been a lot of uh, YouTubing for me. And then there, um, the website that the government, the tribal government maintains has been pretty good too for uh, becoming connected to things like newsletters and tribal business. So how, at this point, do you feel the most connected to the tribe? Like people that you've met or like besides, besides YouTube, how do you feel the most connected to your tribe? That's a great question. I think for me, I felt the most connected as I've had the opportunities to um, engage with uh, tribal government processes. Um, where they've asked for feedback from tribe members. And then also, uh, strangely enough, as I've worked the bureaucracy, like I had a son, and so getting him registered is one of the main opportunities I've had to interface with people. And they're all just so wonderful. Um, so that's been a great opportunity for me to connect because it is it is difficult to feel super connected to the tribe when uh, they're out in Oklahoma and I'm uh, stuck in Utah for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. What are some of the blessings that you have found as you have have uh, learned about this? I think for me, it's brought this openness uh, to to how I view myself. It's really helped me to step beyond just uh, viewing myself as like a, a really simple person that like doesn't have any texture or richness to like, my ancestry and history, and to really see with new eyes, uh, I guess, the diversity that goes into each of us, uh, like just the idea that there are all these different people uh, that contribute to who we are today. And I've really appreciated being able to uh, look at my history in that light and to have this completely new avenue to explore, um, to connect with. And strangely enough, even though I've always liked the Book of Mormon, it has really enriched my appreciation of it, especially when I read these narratives about uh, the people in the Book of Mormon changing their identity and sometimes losing or regaining it. Like it's, it's just been so interesting to me as I've searched for this identity to read about a group uh, such as the Lamanites who are, we read over and over again, like whether it refers to them as a political body or a racial group, they'll have this period where they have this very clear identity and then they'll splinter. Some of them will convert to the gospel. Others will go off and do different things. And then they'll change their names. And then a generation or two later, you'll see the different groups popping up again, sometimes composed of different people. And it's just been so interesting to me, this idea that your identity, like who you affiliate with, it can change over and over again, but you can really do a lot to create or pull meaning from that. Like in the time after Christ visits, Nephite and Lamanite just means someone who believes the gospel and someone who doesn't believe the gospel. And so for me, it's been, what meaning can I find in this identity? And it has been that meaning of a family, of learning these different ways that family is appreciated by different cultures, of learning to appreciate different ways of viewing the world and different ways of viewing myself. Yeah, I love that. Have you, as you've been uh, researching this, have you also spent time researching your family history? Yes, it's uh, it's really motivated me to learn a little bit more. Um, I'm not, I don't come from one of those families where they say, oh, my aunts and uncles have done the work for generations back to Adam. So it feels in a lot of ways like I'm still on the Wild West uh, with some branches of the family, especially on my father's side where there's no history of the church. And so learning about this has really encouraged me to not just find names or dates, but to pay more attention to those other details, even things like where were they living between the different censuses. I think it's so cool that uh, the church has made available or has made it so easy to attach these historical sources to people's profiles and family tree. And it makes it so much easier to kind of start to see the shape of their life as you see, oh, they were born here, they moved here, they were living here. 
I, as you can just trace that development of their life. Have you found any in particular that you've connected with? Hmm, that's a great question. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, uh, but I will say that it really is uh, a special joy to find like a, a new family to have just a name that doesn't have very much attached to it and then have like that breakthrough moment where you find their sibling and that leads you to the rest of their family or something like that. It almost feels like you're rediscovering this lost history. And I get the sense sometimes that these are people who probably haven't had anybody think about them in a long, long time. And it's a special feeling for me to think, uh, you know, I might be thinking, I might be the only person alive who's thinking about this person as they're up there in the spirit world uh, that that just seems special to me that sometimes we, we might be that only connection someone has as they're waiting on the other side that's a really cool thought I mean I mean for for those of us simple-minded like myself going like to Coco Disney's Coco where <laughs> they have yeah they're like well you've been forgotten and then they disappear so Right. Yeah. I have to imagine, like, I mean, just in my regular life, it feels special when somebody mentions that they were talking about you when you weren't around. And, you know, we're alive. We have reason for people to think about us. But to think, like, when you've been dead for 40 years, for 80 years, for a couple generations, like, it's, yeah, that idea of, oh, I'm just completely forgotten. Like, I have nobody down there who thinks of me, who, who will care about me. And then to be the first person to kind of unearth that name, like I have to imagine that that'll lead to a special connection in the next life. Yeah, totally. Do you have siblings? I do. I'm the oldest of nine siblings. Oh, hey. <laughs> are, <laughs> yep. are any of them on the same type of journey as you are? Uh, yes, I talk with my adult siblings pretty regularly about it, uh, just sharing cool stories or little fun facts um and we've and i've talked with my younger siblings too about uh starting to learn the language and incorporating it back into our lives so how supportive has your your wife been in this in this journey uh, she's been remarkably supportive she's the daughter of uh or let me phrase this better. Her mother has dual citizenship with Canada and America, and her grandmother is actually from England. So I think she has a lot of appreciation for this, uh, for appreciating, you know, the different places you come from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Austin, now that you are on this journey and you have a supportive wife and you said that you have a son how are you going to teach him these things? Like, what what are some of the things that you are learning that you want to share with him to pass on? And um, yeah, like like what's what's the future hold for you? Yeah, so I'm hoping that as I continue this journey of kind of self discovery, but also, I guess also not self discovery, just discovery, uh, that I can pass all of it on to my children, to my son right now, and then whatever children come next, uh, because I want them to have a, a better experience than I did, uh, where they don't feel completely cut off and then like they're coming as outsiders, but like they can at least be in a position to say, oh yeah, dad taught me about this. Or, you know, I, I may not be uh, fluent in Cherokee, but we used phrases at home or we learned, uh, we learned things from our parents. Because that's uh, special to me, being able to pass on a culture. And even though for me, it's been uh, learning from outside sources because of that, uh, that gap from wherever in my family tree that kind of either passed out or was given up to acculturate, I want to be able to add these family ties. So that it's not just something like, oh yeah, you are descended from this person, but there's this sense of, and it's something we've reclaimed and it's something I can pass to you and you can pass to your children. So I hope my children can appreciate that, uh, just as I hope they appreciate uh, the cultural aspects my uh, my wife shares with them, like the nursery rhymes from England that she knows and things like that. I, th I feel like uh, when children are able to appreciate these different parts of who they are, it helps them 
uh, have more compassion and empathy for other people. And it helps them to be more curious. Uh, like you referenced Coco earlier, and I've been learning a lot about uh, Day of the Dead now that I have the opportunity to interact with more Hispanic folks. And I love it. It's so wonderful. Uh, there's so much, I think, that we can gain from other cultures uh, that make us look at the world with a little bit more beauty or a little bit more understanding. So I'm hoping they can have that same experience uh, and ha have some built-in points of comparison. Yeah. So you said you've been watching some YouTube videos. What are some of the favorite things that you've learned from from those and like some of the favorite things you've learned from those um, more academic research that you've you've uh, indulged in? Yeah. So uh, as I alluded to earlier, the stories have got to be just my overall favorite thing. Uh, I love seeing the stories. Uh, it's one of the few times, you know, when I'm watching something that I slow it down to the normal speed and I just let it play. But uh, there's, uh, the stories have been really cool for me because, you know, I grew up uh, hearing about Aesop's fables and, you know, those classic stories like the tortoise and the hare or, or the uh, Brothers Grimm fairy tales like Jack and the Beanstalk. And so learning that there's this really rich tradition of stories that come from uh, my own tribe has just been really exciting. And it's been uh, a new angle on things. Like you see these kind of universal stories. Um, sorry, I'll just say like, you see these comparisons. Like I remember in school learning about Anansi the spider in Africa and how he's this, uh, all these stories about, you know, this trickster spider. And then seeing that there's similar archetypes in these Cherokee myths. It's been so cool for me to discover that like even though we have these different ways of expressing things across cultures, we kind of have a lot of the similar ideas. And it's also cool uh, just living in America to hear these American born stories instead of something that came from Europe or another part of the world to feel like, yeah, these are home homebred, like American grown stories. Are there any that, that you can think of that you'd share right now? Oh, I don't know if I know any uh, well enough to share myself, but I can recommend um, I can recommend two that I remember enjoying a lot. And one of them is uh, about the origin of stickball. I believe it's just called the stickball game. And the other one is called How Rabbit. Um, let's see, I think it's the same story about how the rabbit got his long ears and his legs, how he got his long ears and legs. A rabbit is kind of one of those uh, trickster type characters in a lot of these stories where he's fooling coyotes or uh, you know, finagling his way into getting a better physical attributes. So he's a very fun character to follow. Cool. Um... <clears throat> So on to some different questions. Have you served a mission? Yes, I did. Uh, that was another big experience for me, learning to appreciate different culture, because I served my mission in South Korea. And uh, let me tell you, it's not the same as America. <laughs> it was really wonderful to get to go to Asia and learn a completely different language and uh, become part of a culture that is much more uh, focused on being connected than American culture is. Um, how how long have you been home from South Korea? Mm, I've been home for seven years now. Yeah. Um, how long have you been married? I've been married. Uh, let's see. That's an excellent question. <laughs> <Should I laughs> but I've been married for six years. I met my partner um, within that first year of being home. And we got married uh, fairly quickly. Cool. And what do you do now? So right now, I'm a student at Utah Valley University in their graduate program studying marriage and family therapy. And then I also work for them full time so that we can live in an apartment and, you know, uh, <laughs> afford a child who loves to eat everything. What's your plans when you graduate? So I'm hoping to go back out to Kansas and uh, provide marriage and family therapy out there. 
There's a lot fewer therapists out there than there are here in Happy Valley, Utah. Uh, so I'm hoping I can help fill that press for services and also bring some culturally aware uh, service. You said that you um, have a lot to do with Hispanic population right now. What? What's? How is that? Well, we just have the opportunity at church to uh, interact with a lot more. For instance, our bishop, he's great. Uh, he's from Mexico. And so uh, just having an opportunity to serve closely with him has given me the opportunity to learn more about that culture, which has always been present, I feel like, in my life. But I've never taken the plunge to actually talk with people about it and learn more about it. Cool. Uh, what was your undergrad? My undergraduate was psychology and family life. Wow. Um, so as you've uh, been married and been in this ward that you're in, how long have you been in the ward? The same amount of time? Almost. We moved around to a few different places when we were first married. But we ended up in the current ward we're in for the last five years, which is uh, very long for this area's standards. It tends to be pretty transient, uh, but I think that's given us a real appreciation for learning to live in the moment. <laughs> yeah. You can't wait around to see how long folks are going to live here when you have people moving in and out within six months to a year. It's kind of taught us that if you want to be friends with somebody or if you want to get to know them, you just have to take the first opportunity you can and not drag your feet for sure so what are some of the things that you've learned in the ward that you're in like from people like what are some life lessons that you've learned i would say one of the life lessons i've learned has been not to um or just not to resent oh i'm sorry that's my phone <laughs> has been not to resent the way life goes. Like to, there's a season to everything. People come and people go and you can't really control that. And it applies in the small scale to things like moving and in the large scale to, uh, to bigger life things like dying or career changes. And so I think living here and being encouraged to really do things like minister has helped me learn that uh, you know, life might feel like it's in fast forward sometimes, but you still have to appreciate it. You still have to live. Uh, you still have to take it one day at a time. Like I think about the Lord's advice to the saints as they were heading out west uh, to plant crops. And he said, you know, I'm not going to say you're going to be here to reap them, but you're going to plant and you're going to treat it like you're going to be here for a long time. And so I think being here, uh, getting the opportunity to know wonderful people who leave uh, sometimes it feels like my only months later has taught me that uh, you just got to take people as they are. You can't just wait to see if they're going to be worth getting to know. Another lesson I've learned has been um, the difference that acknowledging a person can make. And that sounds really simple, but I've just seen the impact it makes when individuals uh, learn each other's names. Uh, it makes such a difference. It's made such a difference to me. And then I've seen it make a difference to other people uh, when they're called out by name, when you just are able to greet them by name, uh, when you show that you know who they are. And it's such a simple thing, but it, it, it can be hard and it can be embarrassing when you uh, have to ask someone for the third or fourth time to remind you of their name. But I found that it's so much more rewarding than just uh, dancing around not knowing who they really are for months at a time you know i actually totally think that it's easier to just be like i can't remember your name right now than to be like um you <laughs> <laughs> thank you brother you Hi. you brother brother <laughs> <laughs> exactly and you know we get in our heads i think about uh about if we're gonna seem awkward or if things are gonna be weird and it's like, you know what, even if things do, even if we do have an interaction that's a bit awkward or, or is a little less than we hoped, uh, what I've learned is like people don't really spend a lot of time thinking about other people. They mostly think about themselves. <laughs> yeah. You might have felt like you're a little awkward, but they're going to forget that so quickly because they're worried about what other people are thinking about them. <laughs> totally. And they'll get over it even if, even if at the moment they're like, ugh. 
they'll get over it. <laughs> yeah, I think we we have a lot of grace for each other. Like we have much more grace for others than we often do for ourselves. And I think that leads us sometimes to not um, to maybe not be as bold or to to be as vulnerable, even in a small way, as just connecting with somebody else as we maybe want to be. Yeah. So one question I like to ask my guests is, what is something hard that you've gone through and how did you get through it? Mm, that's a really, really excellent question. Uh, when I think about hard things I've gone through, I think one of the first experiences that comes to mind has been my experience getting into graduate school. I had a pretty good undergraduate experience and I was hoping to just go straight to grad school and graduate quickly and you know, start my career. And instead, it took me uh, probably three years of applying to schools before I finally found the right one uh, that also wanted me at the same time. And the way it works is you apply uh, usually in the winter. You apply once and you interview in the spring and then by summer, you find out if you've made it or not, and then you repeat it again. So once a year. <laughs> and it can be really hard because you feel like you're putting yourself out there in a really vulnerable way where you're you know, asking them to judge you, to say, uh, do you want me or not? And it was really rough uh, those first two years, taking those rejections um, and having this sense of like, oh, I'm failing to move ahead in my career. I'm not living up to what I wanted to be. I'm letting my family down because I'm delaying uh, my career. And it's really difficult because you feel like you're letting other people down. Uh, other people care a lot about you too. Family and friends all, all say they'll pray for you and help you with, with the application process. And then you have to go back and say, well, we didn't make it. And that's a really crummy feeling especially when it means all right that's another year of waiting and after the second year you start thinking yeah is this is this within my reach is this something i can do and for me this was a really great experience uh, because it really rubbed my nose in some failure and i think that's when you know when our arm of flesh fails that's when we really learn uh, that the lord does remain with us whether we're doing well or not and i think for me it helped me uh, to accept uh, his guidance in my life better. I ended up working uh, jobs I wouldn't have worked if I'd been in graduate school. And it made it so that we could, it was financially viable for us to have a child. And I'm so grateful to have my son now. I can't imagine my life being any different. Uh, but if I had just been able to decide what I want in life, it would have been different. So it really humbled me and taught me a little bit more about about trusting in the Lord's path. Uh, because hard things happen and we can either ruminate and become bitter about them, or we can learn to see God in it and seek our way forward. And so I feel like that experience for me has helped me to not just say the words that God has the timing or God has the plan, but to really understand that it means uh, God understands sometimes that we face disappointments uh, we face failure. And I think he allows us to feel bad for those things, even as he knows he has something grander in store for us in the long term. And so I really appreciate that he's willing to let us be human, uh, even as he has uh, these better things for us. Yeah, I totally agree. And sometimes the answer is just no. I mean, and, and yeah. that's a learning experience in itself. Yeah, learning to hear a no, I feel like, is actually much harder than learning what yes sounds like. <laughs> um, this is another question that I love to ask. What are What is a tender mercy that you have received that you know Heavenly Father was speaking specifically to you or showing you specifically that he loves you as an individual? Oh, this is a question I should think about more often. <laughs> I think for me, it's been, 
as someone who doesn't just like uh, feel a burning in my bosom every morning, as someone who feels like it takes a little bit more effort to feel the spirit, um, I've learned to really appreciate when I see a clear answer to a prayer. And one of the prayers I've found uh, that for me uh, have the clearest answers are just when I ask the Lord for an opportunity to serve or to minister to somebody. And in my experience, each time I've made that prayer, uh, there's been something, even small random things in that day where I have that opportunity uh, to help someone jump a car or to give somebody a ride or, or to answer a question that I was texted. And it's in those little moments where I can recognize, I asked God for a chance to do this. And here it is, uh, something that I don't normally do. It's a really tender mercy for me to feel like, to feel that confirmation that I'm still connected to God, uh, that he's, that he still hears me, that I'm still capable of recognizing him in my life. Uh, because I think that's, you know, one of the things I know I worry about, and I assume other people worry about, is, is God there and I'm just not seeing him? So those experiences where I just see those clear answers to prayers uh, really reinforce my faith that uh, my connection with him is still strong. Yeah. Have you ever had a hard time in your life where you have, um, your testimony has waned? Uh, yeah, I would say, <laughs> I think like a lot of teenagers, I have that classic phase of not really knowing what I want to believe or just not feeling as committed. Um, I'm trying to think of as an adult if I've experienced that, but I feel like uh, since my mission, since getting married, there's always been a very strong commitment. Uh, but I would say yes, as a teenager, I think I experienced that very typical phase where you want to explore alternatives and consider the world without uh, the gospel. So how did you get through that? How did you uh, change that attitude? I think for me, it came down to, um, as I explored like what life would be like without the gospel, it didn't have anything that was really enticing. You know, it didn't have anything that was inherently more appealing than the life I lived in the gospel. And I think uh, there's... I don't know, I guess, I guess I would say the light of Christ, a sense of conscience that just deep down says like, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't feel great and I don't see a long future in it. Whereas like in the gospel, there's such a clear sense of uh, a future and connection to the past. Uh, like that phrase you shared earlier, the seven generations previous and seven generations uh, ahead, I could see that in the gospel. Whereas when I considered life without it, it just felt very isolated and uh, cold, not as warm. Definitely. Um, that's kind of interesting. We were, for home church today, we were talking about repentance, about when you do something, <clears throat> well, when you do something wrong, and we were describing the different feelings that you, you felt, and then... Uh, the opposite after you repent, um, mm -hmm. how those, those are good feelings and happy feelings. And my, my daughter said, I have, I have a different set of words to describe those two. She's like empty and full. And I'm like, yeah, I totally agree. That was such a good description. So I think yeah. that's kind of what you're describing right now too. You can choose empty and you can right. choose full. Yeah. I love that especially because to me, the gospel, like what it's really about is relationships uh, with God and with each other. That's why the two great commandments are love God and love each other. And that's like an emptiness or a fullness in your life. You can live a life where you're contracting, where you're turned inwards, where you just kind of focus more and more on yourself, or you can have a direction in life where you're expanding, where you're connecting with more people, uh, connecting more with God. And that's just such a great contrast, empty and full. You said you want to do counseling when you graduate. Um, are you are you hoping to do 
LDS services counseling, or are you just going to a, a uh, I don't know, a traditional office? Is that what you would call it? Uh-huh. Yeah, so I'm happy to be a resource uh, for Latter-day Saints, especially because I understand that a lot of the time in the Latter-day Saint community, there's kind of a protectiveness, a feeling of like, well, I only want to see an LDS therapist because I know they'll respect my beliefs and understand them and things like that. And um, and especially, you know, if there's parents who are nervous about their youth, I would rather they see an LDS therapist than not see anybody because they're worried about what they might be told. Uh, but I do plan on just uh, practicing in the public um, or just to the general population, I guess you would say. I think just everybody needs that ability to uh, strengthen the family. Yeah. Um, and as you've been studying, have you seen the the corresponding truths of the family, the proclamation? Oh, yes. Uh, I think one of the things that's become really apparent to me is that one of the most uh, significant privileges you experience and a person can experience in life is just having parents who are together uh, whatever that looks like like when there are two of them involved it just provides so much more so many more resources for children and for each other that's really reinforced my testimony of the family and then even some of the almost odd like small details from it like time for recreation or uh, the way it encourages families to treat each other, they're borne out by research. Uh, we do need times where families just have fun together. Uh, you know, it can't always be, <laughs> and I don't know a family where it is, but I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> it can't always be a sermon and a life lesson. Uh, we need times where we kick back, where we just have fun. Uh, we need times where uh, parents establish boundaries. Like I, the research is clear that children do better with structured home lives where the parents are willing to lovingly have some rules uh, to help them grow. Yeah. I love the family proclamation. Okay. I have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? I love the concept of the tribes of Israel because uh, like we talked about earlier, there's a sense of unity and diversity. Like there's 12 tribes and I, in the past, I didn't really think about why beyond when you get a patriarchal blessing, it'll say you're a part of one of them. But to me, it says there's space for differences in the social kingdom uh, that even as we're all working to be Christ-like, we'll still be who we are. Like there's room for different flavors of Christ-like people. Uh, so that's the diversity part. And then there's this unity of in spite of these differences we have, we all have this purpose. Uh, we all belong to the same family. And I love that. I love this idea that in the end, the whole work of the gospel is to basically bring all the kids home <laughs> for us all to, to come back home and to see each other and to see each other, not just as a people, but as family members. Uh, we say brother and sister so casually at church. Sometimes I think we forget that we really are trying to see each other as fellow siblings and um i just i can't wait for the day that uh, we can experience that in the presence of heavenly father uh, because sibling relationships are great but uh having the parent there having our parents there is good too i just can't wait for us all to be reunited as one large family again yeah well, I totally agree with that, and I appreciate all the things you've you've shared today. Um, it's it's uh, it's nice to know there are people that are trying to do good, and uh, that that they recognize doing good as a gift to themselves and to Heavenly Father at the same time. Uh, thank you for your time, Austin. Thank you so much. I've been learning about repentance. I've done things that I've had to repent for, and I, I've i always felt better after I've repented for them. But then there are days when I'm like, well, doggone it, I was 
pretty okay today. Not perfect. I didn't say perfect. I was pretty okay today. To be honest, I have actually struggled a lot in my life with the whole daily repentance thing. I'm like, what? What is daily repentance? I'm not doing things that I need to repent for. And, um, and I'm, I'm 44 years old, guys, and I'm finally figuring this out. Daily repentance is not for the huge things because we don't do huge, stupid things every single day. Well, maybe some of us do, but most of us that are trying really hard to not do really big, stupid things, we are told we still need daily repentance. I'm like, what? What is daily repentance? Why? 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 And I've finally figured it out and I'm doing it. I have always been doing it. But uh, unless I am wrong and somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, but um, daily repentance means realigning. Repentance doesn't always mean the whole um, going through the checklist of things you need to do. Daily repentance means daily returning, re aligning, re refocusing on Jesus Christ and him and the plan and his atonement and trying to do better even the next day. Even if you had a pretty good day, do better the next day. Keep readjusting. And I know it's so dumb that it's taken me so long to figure this out, but I... I think, I think I needed somebody to say, hey, Andrea, this is what it means. Because I've heard daily repentance, daily repentance, daily repentance. But this is what it means. It means refocusing, returning, re realigning. It goes back to Elder Uchtdorf's myriad talks about airlines and re, um, fixing our routes and it goes back to all those things where we just, it's the little things. And that has helped me. That has helped me a lot to know that I am daily repenting. I am trying and the harder and the better that I try and the more I acknowledge that I need Jesus. That's what, that's what it is. And I do. I daily need him. I need him all the time. And um, I need him even when I'm happy. When I'm doing great, I need him because he's the best. He's perfect. And all the other things that I love in this life, I want to have because I know Jesus. I want to have those things and those people. Because I know Jesus and I want to know him better. I hope that that is a useful thought for you today. Because it's on my mind a lot lately. And I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com. <laughs>